Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dante Luber. I'm here with Laura Casabella and Professor Gina Hu at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. And we're here for the Chow Lectures. The Chow Lectures are a chance for students and researchers to meet renowned mathematicians and familiarize themselves with their work. So, Jun Ha is this year's guest of the Chow Lectures, and he's a professor at the Princeton University and 2022 Fields Medalist. Uh, hello, Jun. Hi. It, it was a real pleasure to be able to attend your lectures about Lorenzo Polyomials, and also thank you for your time. So, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. Yeah, that's a real fun uh, meeting people and uh, giving talks here. It's a good time. Good to hear. So I wanted to start by asking you to um, briefly describe your research to the people listening. Yeah, I work at the interface of algebraic geometry and combinatorics, and I try to find as many connections and points of interactions as many as possible. Sometimes I work and think in, as algebraic geometer and use that intuition to solve some problems in combinatorics, and other times I do the other way. I use combinatorial construction and combinatorial understanding of finite objects to create and study some interesting spaces. Nice. Uh, so Lorentzian polynomials were the main topic of discussion for pretty much the entire child lecture. Um, can you briefly explain what those are and for uninitiated? Yeah, Lorentzian polynomials are plain old polynomials, nothing fancy. It has a certain number of variables, maybe five variables, and it has degree, maybe it has degree seven, and you can write them down on the blackboard, and you can play with it, you can differentiate, and change coordinates, and so on and so on. And it is a completely elementary theory, say, at the level of calculus, first year calculus. And Still, you can derive a lot of wonderfully subtle properties of various seemingly unrelated combinatorial objects. And the part that makes me fascinating about this subject is that a lot of the intuitions that motivated the proofs and the statements of the main result in this theory were guided by geometric insights, as in algebraic geometric insights although they are never directly used in proof or appear in the statements. So, Lorentzian polynomials uh, are just an example of how your work connects algebraic geometry and combinatorics, as you have stated. Uh, do you have any other example of fruitful intersections between these two fields? There are many classical examples uh, developed during the last decades or even longer period of time by work of many, many people. I think the classical example of this is the theory of toric varieties, where the theory of polytops and convex bodies is beautifully related to the construction and study of certain algebraic varieties, where things are very, very explicit and computable and yet subtle enough to be able to guide algebraic geometers where to go and what to look and so on. So throughout your career you've solved some pretty long-standing conjectures and problems that a lot of people were interested in. Um, are there any open problems now from either algebra and combinatorics or any other branch of math that you think are the most interesting you'd like to see solved first, soonest? I know many, many good problems. Yeah. yeah. I hope we can solve them all. Probably we cannot, but maybe that's a good thing as well. Um, yeah. I don't want to pin down one thing that just uh, that makes you more rigid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so from your work, it's clear that you um, are trying to pursue beauty in math. And you've already stated this in the past interview that beauty is very important in mathematical research. So, what exactly do you find beautiful in mathematics? What's beauty? I don't know, I did say that, uh, but now I think about it, it's a little bit cringy. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I <laughs> maybe a better and a closer to like a real life uh, expression would be fun. Like uh, some of the phenomena that we see are truly like unexpected. Before you see it, it's hard to guess, and once you see it, it's a lot of fun, and you can like play with it. And it doesn't get old if you have a really good toy, and then you can play it for years, and you will still be able to find a way to have fun with it. And uh, and I like those kind of mathematics, and like everybody else does. And my goal is to yeah find some more of those. So fun over beauty. <laughs> yeah, fun and beautiful. I mean, you can choose whichever expression you prefer, but uh, yeah. And um, do you have an example of a fun or beautiful theorem? Um, example. So I mean, it's very hard to find a hay in a haystack like yeah. if you ask that way. So many things qualify. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's hard to say, but one theorem that I really like um, is this explicit description of uh, tropical linear spaces or tropicalizations of linear spaces uh, studied by Professor Bells and Terry Guardiola and Colleen Cleveland many years ago. It's a very simple description, very explicit, proof not necessarily hard, but the theorem or the definition that it led to of tropical near spaces became the like a prologue to a very long and intricate fun story. So I like that theorem a lot. Nice. Um, so to divert from I guess a uh, strictly mathematical topic. So it's been said that you had a somewhat unconventional career path. Um, would you be interested in describing your career path and just maybe some of the uh, I don't know whether it's unconventional. I started relatively late, or not too late. Uh, yeah, I, I started seriously doing math in mid twenties. Uh, so I was that I tried this and that, and mathematics suited my interest as. There's nothing like a strange or odd about it. It's, uh, One question though, yeah. though what, what did you maybe try before uh, you went to math? Oh, I wanted to be a writer. Um, and uh, I had put some, but <laughs> not too serious effort for that. And I have uh, also spent some time trying to some, learn some physics, in particular astro. And, uh, always found the subject very awe-inspiring. But uh, the reality of actually doing it, if I, once I had a taste of it, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have yeah, more theoretical like uh, disciplines like mathematics. Uh, so I found it more attractive as an activity, not as an idea. And also you said you uh, started doing that in your mid-twenties. But then you went from starting a PhD to solving long-standing conjectures and then being awarded the Fields Medal in just a few years. So is there anything you would attribute your rapid success to? Yeah, that 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 process is uh, how that happened is a complete mystery. <laughs> I guess uh, yeah. You have to be very, very lucky. Yeah, I was very, very lucky. And Judging from observations of a few cases, it appears that certain people tend to be lucky. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how I did it. But uh, one thing that is probably correct to say is that there is a very rough algorithm to have a tendency to be lucky, which is try a lot of different things many, many times, mm -hmm. then you're almost guaranteed. If you try enough number of times, then you're almost guaranteed to be lucky at some point. And I guess that happened to me and other people. 
Not always, but from, from time to time. You can't be just luck, right? Uh, luck is a not an easy concept to define. Not a well defined concept. So. But uh, as a proxy for whatever is happening, uh, I think it's good enough. Right. <laughs> and were there any times in your career and your story that you were unlucky, or were there any obstacles you encountered on this road? Like right now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always feel that you're like stuck. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to recognize that you are in fact growing at the moment. Like uh, after many years, if you look back, of oh, those years, uh, I was growing very fast, and I. I was mathematically maturing and I was mathematically active. But if you observe your current self, like from zero inches away, then you always feel that like you're stuck and you're not moving anywhere and uh, you don't have as much energy as you used to. And yeah, I feel like that today, but uh, I know that such a feeling does not necessarily mean that it's actually true from just uh, experience. So I'm kind of hoping that secretly I'm going somewhere. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's an amazing answer. And I think there are lots of people in math or outside math or PhD students that really appreciate an answer like that. Yeah, I think growth is a very, very slow process, mm -hmm. especially in subject areas like mathematics, where your strength or maturity is very hard to measure locally. So, yeah, I think it's good to have some faith in yourself. And <laughs> It's really that uh, yeah, things will work out concerning like the heart problems that makes you suffer at the moment. And they did for you. So far, <laughs> I'm hoping that this time is not an exception, but I'm completely stuck right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, talking about the fields manual. Um, what was your initial reaction to winning the Fields Medal and how did it affect your life? For example, did it affect your productivity in a positive or negative way? Well, I mean, I'm very, very grateful that Math Community decided to award this very prestigious medal to me uh, and uh, I feel that I'm very lucky to be a recipient of it. But uh, my initial reaction was that like, oh, this is such a headache and it's still going to be a complete disaster in a sense like uh, it was. I mean, your, your daily routine uh, gets affected a lot. You are asked to become a different person. For example, you are asked to do like an interview in front of a camera and then <laughs> you are asked uh, some questions and you have to pretend to have some sort of wisdom to share, and which need not be the case. And still you have to say something. And there are a lot of these and uh, you get a lot of emails. And some of them you have to respond. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you, you're a different person afterwards and then you have to find a way to do mathematics as you used to. So I'm trying to figure that out. And do you also feel an increased sense of responsibility towards the mathematical community? Because that is what is expected of you. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, we're social animals, so you if other people look at you in different with different lights, then from inside you also feel that uh, you're a different person now. Yeah. So uh, to transition the question about the Fields Medal, um, but so are there any mathematicians that you admire? You being one of 
the most in my definitions and helped by a lot of people. Are there so many? This yeah. is another one of those questions with uh, too many answers. But not as many answers as like the, your favorite theorem kind of picture. I think I can, uh, if I can function correctly in front of a camera, I think I can come up with like 40 names that I can confidently say that I admire. But while being here at Leipzig, why not, uh, uh, why not Bernd Schoenfeld uh, doing his work? And so, so he gave a summer lecture series on tropical geometry. That must be 2007 or 2008 while I'm still in Seoul, just uh, beginning to learn mathematics, a little bit of this and that. I had no idea uh, what tropical geometry is. Uh, in fact, I had no idea what combinatorics was. In fact, I have never saw, for example, the definition of a graph. Like, uh, I saw some pictures of a graph. There are some straight lines and some funny dots here and there, but I've never encountered like a whole definition of a graph, and I wasn't able to like formulate it myself. Like it's not. That. <laughs> um, but there was this uh, summer lecture series on tropical geometry that was happening, and I happened to notice that I didn't. I don't know how I learned about it. I went there and it changed my life. And, and I'm thinking about tropical varieties uh, from time to time until now. So maybe like these things all should count as luck. Like, yeah, so this is a pure accident that I came to work in combinatorial algebraic geometry. A lot of steps combined. Yeah. Um, do you think you have also inspired younger mathematician in a similar way? Yeah, I hope so, but uh, of course I have no idea. And in particular, would you have any piece of, of advice for early career mathematicians? <laughs> <laughs> like us. <laughs> Yeah, I, my, my only advice, I think, well, people say many things. Um, all good to know if you can implement, but everyone is so different and certain advices are harder to implement. But I think the, something that is universally true is that it's extremely important and in whatever career stage, to have the ability to keep yourself happy so your mind should be healthy. Otherwise, there is no good math. I don't, I think it's extremely unlikely for someone to come up with very fun or beautiful structure if this person has been depressed uh, for many years because this. Mathematics, I think it's not, uh, does not come from like a moment of inspiration. It, even in cases where it looks like that must be the case, that must, there must have been a long period of preparation that enabled that moment and to build up and persevere for such a long time and pursue like large scale projects, you need a very stable, happy, healthy mind. And how to maintain that, that depends on who you are and how, e how easy that is. That also depends who you are, but uh, sooner or later, you have to figure that out in order to perform well as a mathematician. And just in general, it's better to be happy rather than otherwise. Yeah, and how has it been for you? Have you been able to maintain a good work-life balance or have you <sighs> struggled in this? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't so good at this when I was younger. I think I'm getting better at this as I grow older. Still trying. Uh, and so then do you have any 
you know, would you like to talk about any of your passions outside of the world of mathematics that you use to keep your mind happy and healthy? Well, these days I I try to exercise regularly. Yeah. But other than that, uh, I don't know. I have two kids and, and I don't have that much free time to. <laughs> yeah. So you've had to give talks on your work to many, many times and to probably a very wide range of mathematical people with different mathematical backgrounds. Yes. And probably some people often from outside of mathematics. Um, I guess, what do you think about when you're preparing a lecture and maybe how do you tailor a lecture to a different audience? Yeah, it's uh, definitely talks are easier to give if your audience share fairly substantial background as you do. Otherwise, it gets harder and harder. I think the hardest talk that I gave recently was in my son's elementary school classroom. Can be hard. And correspondingly, you have to put a lot of effort uh, in preparation. But in a child lecture like this, where a lot of like minded people with similar backgrounds, right? It's, uh, preparing talk is such a pleasure. You can do it on the morning of the lecture day, and usually that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, the giving public lectures and so on is, uh, is a very important uh, and meaningful, valuable activity, but it's very painful, at least for me. A lot of your famous words have co-authors. Um, so what is your collaborative process like? How do you approach projects that have multiple uh, authors? Yeah, I guess this is also a uh, uh, very important part of being lucky. You have to meet the right people and be friends with them. So it's, it's a human activity. You need to form the human bond in order to think together and produce together. And how do you find these people? I, I don't know, but this is the part of being lucky. I don't even remember when was the first time I met all these people. Somehow it happened. We started talking and it was a lot of fun. And we decided to talk some more. And maybe there are some other big person that was interested in the same thing. We make friends with them. And at some point, we do good work and write papers together. So it's a social activity. It is a social activity. And yeah, I know, of course, some people say that social skill is a skill, but I don't think anyone can deny that uh, the element of love plays a lot here. Somehow you have to find like-minded yet complementary person to make the spark happen. Uh, this was very inspiring, and I personally learned a lot. And uh, we would like to thank you again for your time. Oh, your thank you. And your lectures. Yeah, thank you. That was my pleasure.